If the tone of Pakistan's 34-year-old foreign minister, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, during an interaction at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. on September 27th is any indication, Islamabad may not be particularly eager to revive any semblance of normalcy with India just yet. Bhutto Zardari went out of his way to highlight the 2002 Gujarat riots the then Chief Minister Narendra Modi's handling of them and how the US revoked his visa until he became Prime Minister. The comments were provocative, especially in the way they were delivered. However, on the question of whether war in any situation in the world was wise, he said somewhat cryptically that he agrees with Modi's counsel to Russia's President Vladimir Putin against it. As far as a responsible relationship uh, with uh, India, well, that's what we want and that's what we've always wanted, as I mentioned in my uh, talk, sort of comments earlier. 2010 was the first time after 1965 where we unilaterally uh, started trade with India. We took the political hit, touched the third rail of Pakistani politics, had the defy Pakistan in every alphabet of basket of deplorables, um, protesting and calling us traitors and whatnot. And that was a result of the fact that we knew that us taking the political risk uh, had the potential of being reciprocated on the other side by someone who also wanted a responsible relationship uh, with Pakistan. Uh, but as you and I know, a lot has changed since 2010. Uh, and from our perspective, this is a very different India. Uh, Mr. Modi is not uh, Mr. S uh, Manmohan Singh or even Mr. Wajpai. He is the same prime minister who, until he became prime minister, could not come to the United States. You wouldn't give him a visa because of the massacre that occurred in Gujarat. And while we all hoped, and as some like to say, hope is not a plan, uh, that things would go differently, they didn't. He is quite actively uh, and with concentrated purpose over the course of his two terms now, actively tried to turn India away from its uh, secular roots where all Indian citizens had a place to a Hindu supremacist India. That's fair enough within his own country as much as you sort of oppose it, that's, that's sort of the direction it's taking. But that has had direct consequences for the internationally disputed region of Kashmir, which has made our conversations all the more difficult. When they unilaterally, in violation of international law in violation of UN Security Council resolution. Sounds similar? Unilaterally undermined the internationally recognized disputed status of Kashmir. The only portion, a piece of their, under their control, that still has a Muslim majority was Kashmir. And since August 2019, they have been violating international law and proactively converting that Muslim majority into a minority in their own land. And that makes it incredibly difficult uh, for us to engage. We definitely want, particularly the younger generation, to have live in a peaceful neighborhood, we're not as burdened by the baggage of history. Uh, but to have a res reasonable, responsible relationship, you need responsible, reasonable neighbors. And at the moment, um, the space is uh, the, 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 the space hasn't been developed. There was a recent uh, meeting between uh, Narendra Modi and uh, Vladimir Putin, in which uh, Mr. Modi said this is not the time for war. I wonder if you were quoting him intentionally or just agreeing. I agree. But Zardari was rather flippant in his dismissal of India's concerns 
over the 450 million package to refit Pakistan's F-16 fighter jets to support counter-terrorism operations. India's Foreign Minister S. Jay Shankar, also in the U.S. at the same time as is Pakistan's vis-a-vis, as is Pakistani vis-a-vis, made headlines when he said neither the U.S. nor Pakistan was fooling anyone by claiming that fighter jets India's Foreign Minister S. Jai Shankar, also in the U.S. at the same time as his Pakistani vis-a-vis, made headlines when he said neither the U.S. nor Pakistan was fooling anyone by claiming that the fighter jets were meant for counter-terrorism operations, implying that their primary purpose was against India. The, uh, the second question, uh, really the number of the question, which is, in a sense, the U.S., uh, 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 relationship with Pakistan and the the military relationship that uh, the U.S. has had. Now you all know that this is not something of recent making. It has gone on for many years. And you also know that uh, very honestly it's, it's, a, it's a relationship that has neither ended up serving Pakistan well nor serving American interests well. So it is really for the United States today to reflect whether this, you know, what are the merits of this relationship, what do they get by, uh, by keeping it uh, sort of uh, uh, continuing. Because at the end of the day, you know, for someone to say, I'm doing this because it is for counter-terrorism, when you are talking of an aircraft like the capability of the F-16, I mean, we are, everybody knows, you know, where they are deployed and what is the use and what is their capability. So, uh, you know, you're not fooling anybody by saying these things. So, the the point is, uh, we we really think uh, countries finally make their choices based on their own interests. And I would make a you know a case if I were to uh, speak to a, a American policymaker, I would really make a case saying, look. What you are doing, forget about us for a moment. It's actually not good for you, what, what you are doing. Reflect on the history. Look at the last many years of where this relationship has taken you. And, and how much, you know, what a cost you have paid for it. Uh, F-16? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Sorry, uh, yeah. come on. Uh, like, obviously the Indians are upset. They're going to be upset about it. Let them be. Yeah, okay.